Bonjour, 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 and welcome to this new weekly live on YouTube. Today will be all about how to improve your French pronunciation. I see we already have some people here. So we have Linda, Andrea, and Connie already, and Yasmin. So cool to see you back here for this new live. Um, today we are going to speak about whether it's a good idea to sound like a native or to try to sound like a native and generally how to improve your pronunciation. So if you're watching, uh, yeah, please say hi. If you haven't said hi, said hi yet and uh, tell us where you are right now. Andrea is in the Miami airport. So I guess you're traveling. Uh, lucky you, not everybody gets to travel these days. Um, and uh, yes, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, two things I need to tell you. Uh, the first thing is that as of this week, um, fortunately for me, but unfortunately for you, my one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching packages are completely booked out. So I will not have uh, another spot for coaching at least for the whole month of March. And basically um, I have eight one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching clients right now. And normally I only have seven spots. So that's even one more than I should have. Um, and yeah, you will have to wait until one of those spots becomes free if you want to do one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, which means that the best way to get a hold of me is here on those weekly lives. So if you have questions or anything about learning French, this place is a great place uh, to ask your questions and to get some guidance for me from me. So that's one thing. The other thing I need to tell you is that, uh, as you might know, my new course, Mastering French Pronunciation, uh, is out now. And it is available until Wednesday for the very discounted price of $89. Uh, yeah, $89 instead of $199. If you are in the French Frontier Accelerator, do not buy it. It is one of the many uh, workshops and courses that you have in the members of the Accelerator. But if you are not in the Accelerator, uh, I would definitely recommend buying it, especially if you have been struggling with French pronunciation, which is also our topic of today. So who is excited to learn more about how to pronounce French um, quote unquote correctly? Actually, we will define what, what, uh, what correctly means. So the first question that I have for today, which I think should be settled once and for all, is should you focus first on grammar or on pronunciation? It's a question that was asked to me um, the first time, I think some six months ago by a one-on-one -on -one student. Uh, who told me, yeah, like, uh, what's more important to do first? And I had never asked this question this way, but it's a really good question. And the answer, I just, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give it to you straight out. The answer is always, always, bonjour, you have Suda here and Colm, hi, nice to see you again. Okay, that was a bit of suspense for you. So should you focus on grammar or pronunciation first? No matter where you are, if your grammar and your pronunciation are both poor, what you should focus on first is always, always, always pronunciation. And there are two reasons for that. Uh, the first reason is that if you have great pronunciation and very poor grammar, you will be speaking broken French, but you will have okay communication, right? It is, if your pronunciation is understandable and your grammar is completely broken, you will still be able to communicate. But in reverse, it's not possible. You could have perfect grammar if your pronunciation is so broken that you cannot be understood then your profit grammar is completely worthless. And the worst part is that grammar takes a long, long, long time to master. Even the quote unquote basics can take a long time to master compared to uh, pronunciation. Because let me show you something. This is how much French grammar there is, OK? So in my coaching with my one-on-one -on -one clients and also in the French Accelerator, I recommend using those two books because I find that those two are enough but it's actually half of what French grammar entails. So there is potentially no end to grammar. When you fall down the grammar rabbit hole, it might never end. On the contrary, pronunciation has an end, which is very clear to see. So this is the handout from the Mastering French Pronunciation course, which I have, uh, the, the course that I am releasing right now, which you can join this, uh, this week for the introductory price. It includes this handout, uh, you know, it includes videos and audios um, and audio courses and practice files. And also you can download the slides. So there's a lot in that course, but also there is this handout and it's 20 pages. And in those 20 pages, there's everything you need to know about French pronunciation. So I hope just like this visualization of it 
is enough to convince you that pronunciation is a lot simpler, right? 20 pages than uh, grammar, right? Does that, does that make sense? So if you are wondering, okay, should I focus on pronunciation or on grammar first? Pronunciation, it's simpler, it gives much better results. If your pronunciation is okay, but your grammar is broken, you will still be good. If your pronunciation, if your grammar is okay, but your pronunciation is horrible, you, you won't get anywhere. So that's also why I decided to uh, release the pronunciation course sooner and also because of the uh, Telegram um, poll, can't speak today, the Telegram poll. So I asked on Telegram what courses you would you like to have first and there was an overwhelming majority of pronunciation and I think it's because for one thing, pronunciation can be very difficult, but also it's very simple if you know how to improve it. So that is the topic for today. Um, yeah, pronunciation can be fixed in two to three weeks easily. This is generally the time it takes for my one-on-one -on -one, for my one-on-one -on -one students. When I work with uh, students one-on-one -on -one and they have troubles with pronunciation at the beginning, I will give them a personalized tongue twister, and that personalized tongue twister, if they repeat it two times a day, like I recommend. After two to three weeks, they'll be done with the pronunciation issue. Now, of course, they'll still have an accent, which will get me to my next point, but an accent is cool, right? Like, it's not the same having an accent versus not being able uh, to be understood when you pronounce French. And uh, in the Mastering French Pronunciation course, of course, you can have a personalized tongue twister. It won't be custom tailored for you, but it is custom tailored for English native speakers with all the sounds that um, are different in French and English. And I'll get to there in a moment. So this live seems to be breaking up a lot, or is it me? I don't know. Uh, do you feel uh, other people live on the call? Do you feel that it's breaking up a lot? Please let me know. I, I, I might be able to change something. Um, let me know if you can understand me. Because es especially with a topic like pronunciation, it's super important to be able to understand it. Uh, Connie's not having any issues. OK, anyone else having issues? It might be your communicate your uh, connection call. Maybe you want to uh, try to restart your computer or or break um, restart your your connection and and join back. That could be the reason. Andres is not breaking up for me. Okay, I'll I'll just assume that it's uh, that is going on well. Right. No, your final name. Okay, cool. Yeah, Colm, I hope you can uh, manage to fix it on on your side. Um. So the second point that I have today is this whole sound like a native who else wants to sound like a native like if it was possible would you like to sound like a native that's actually a it's a real question like i would love to hear your opinions like if you had the possibility and if it was not too hard it wouldn't take too much of an investment would you be wanting would you want to sound like a native like as if you were french so andrea says moi okay andrea you'd like to sound like a native not sound like an american person anyone else wants to sound like a native Yasmin says yes. Uh, Linda says, if it wasn't impossible, sure. OK, it is not impossible. Um, it has been done. Some people have done it. Uh, it's not the kind of thing that I teach, because I think it's the wrong target. But uh, some people have done it. It's a long, challenging, very hard process. You would have to first learn the, the kind of uh, pronunciation that I teach in this course. And then you would have to go to some uh, accent reduction expert to help you sound more like a native, and then you'd have to pick your native from, like, you know, because which native, right? There are tons of uh, French speakers that are native from different places with different accents. So you'd have to pick your native, but it would be uh, possible. Connie says, I don't think I want to sound like a native. I think, personally, I think you have the right answer. Because, so for one thing, it's extremely hard. You would have to, um, you would have to put a lot of work in. And there's one exception. Uh, it's if you are actually faced by discrimination for uh, your accent. That actually is more something that's likely to happen to natives. For example, I know that some people from the south of France uh, would be faced with some uh, prejudices because of their accent being different from the north. And then if they move, they, would, they could be facing discrimination. But this is a topic very different from the situation that you would be in as a non-native speaker who is learning French. Um, so barring this possibility, uh, if you are not facing discrimination for it, I would not recommend wanting to sound like a native. So for one thing, because it's very hard, a very hard, very long process. Second thing, it's misleading. And if you get mistaken for a native, uh, I think it's in the book Fluent Forever by Gabrielle Weiner that there's a, there's a chapter, get mistaken for a native. Maybe you get a boost of ego, but there will, that will create lots of opportunities for misunderstanding. Um, natives will start thinking that you have the exact same culture as they do. 
and they will reference things that you don't know of and they will think you're dumb because you don't know the things that they know, uh, that kind of things. Um, they might think that you're from another place than where you're from. So it, it just creates this situation where people don't really know who you are and you might get into a number of misunderstandings. So depending on your situation, it might not be bad, um, but it can get uncomfortable rather rapidly. And I know that, for example, um, is that Paul Taylor or Sebastian? No, it's Paul Taylor. Paul Taylor is an English uh, comedian who lives in France. And he used to live in France when he was a small kid. And because of that, he can speak French without an accent. And his French is really good, um, except for some grammar and the gender and, first, and things like that. Because he, his French is not great. He just speaks without an accent because he was in France as a kid. And so he, he always has to explain that because according to his own um, saying, if you speak French like an ex and without an accent, uh, and if, if he speaks French without his British accent, which he should have, the French think that he is French but stupid. So they say it as Francais mais con. And would you rather pass as an English native who is very smart and who has learned a foreign language, or would you rather pass as a French native who's stupid? You know, like, it's, this is a real question. Like, if you get mistaken for a native, this is the risk you can be downgraded from a super human person who has learned the language so well to a stupid person who doesn't even know their own language. So your pick. That's another reason. And the last thing uh, that I would put in is uh, it's bad for your soul and your sex appeal. Let me explain. Let we have a comment first. Uh, Yasmin says, I've been mistaken for a native. It was great for my ego, but immediately said no, no, because I can't actually speak more than a few phrases. Right, and this is what happens. Like, if you obsess over pronunciation so well and you're good at mimicking, if you do this course extremely well and you do nothing else, you might get into that situation. So I'm just, it's the caveat to this course. Like, If you enroll in this course, remember, it's not the only course you have to ever take about French. This will fix your pronunciation, but it won't fix the rest. So, yep. So like I was saying, meaning being mistaken for a native is bad for your soul and for yourself, for your uh, sex appeal. So it's bad for your soul because it's like self-rejection. Um, I don't really see a point. Like how much would you have to hate your own existing identity and the person that you are to be wanting to scratch everything of that and end up passing as a French person or a French native somewhere else? I think what makes you you is also the culture that you've had and the experience that you've had and just how much you have learned and progressed in your life. And if you end up sounding like a native, all of this depth is lost from your, um, from your speaking. So for example, if you take me as an example, uh, if you don't mind me being an example, you can hear that I'm not a native English speaker. And to some degree, it's also part of my business and my job and my brand image to not sound like a native. Because if I were to sound like an English native, that might not tell you much about how much I have uh, progressed towards learning a language to fluency, which is what I teach. I mean, I make a living of teaching people to become fluent in French. If I would sound like an English native and sound like I just picked French learning coach as a profession, but I have nothing to do with French, that, that wouldn't add up, right? Do you see, do you see what I mean? So I, I do speak English well. I hope I did spend a lot of time and put a lot of efforts into learning English, but I'm not aiming to sound like a native because it would be removing from my personality and my capacity uh, a lot of depth uh, from my character. So that's something that um, it's, yeah, it's really important to take into account these kind of things. That you might want to be uh, the adorable American lady or the you know, very nice American man or the very nice British person or wherever you're from, if this is part of who you are. So I see this triggers a lot of comments. Let me, uh, let me read that. Yasmin says you have good ears. Yeah, I mean, if you can mimic, like if you can be mistaken by a native, this is not the course for you. You can save $89 right now. This is, this, you don't need this. But if you, if you are in the situation that your French pronunciation is not great and you can't really be understood when you speak French, then this is the course for you. Uh, Andreas says, I spent years lessening my southern accent. It is a little bit bad for your soul, but it's good for trying to avoid discrimination. Right, so that's exactly what I was saying. These kind of things also happen in France. Um, so that is a situation where you might want to lessen your accent just because of that. But it also is something that happens more to natives. Like in your case, Andrea, you are an English native and you have um, lessened your southern accent because of that. Um, so the same thing happens to French natives, but not so much. 
to um, non-native. Um, can I sound like an English native? I don't think I can anymore. Um, it, would be, it would be difficult. Sometimes when I am in a conversation with an English native, I can actually, I would actually mimic their accent. So I would, my accent move, would move more towards theirs. If I speak for a long time or if I'm in a conversation for a long time with an, uh, a British person, I will sound more British. In fact, I will be interviewed for a British podcast um, later this week. I look forward to seeing if I sound different on that podcast than I sound on, on this live. That would, that would be fun. Um, but I, I don't think I can anymore. And it's funny because when I was in university, so um, maybe you don't know this, but I have a bachelor's degree in English literature. And when I was in university, it was a very big part of, I don't know that it counted for so much of the grade, but the, the teachers were insisting on it a lot. And we had to pick between American phonetics and British phonetics, or I think it was phonology, American phonology and British phonology, but like, you know, pronunciation, basically, that's what it's about. And we had to go to like the language lab and record ourselves on little cassettes and we would get terrible grades because it would never sound like, like it should sound. And you were just like, trying really hard to sound like a native. And in the end, I mean, in the end, if you're lucky, you end up passing some uh, English teacher um, degree and you can teach English to the French. And your super great accent, if you achieved it, is not really useful because who cares? I mean, you're in the middle school. If, if you don't speak, like, you know, most teachers in the middle school don't need to have perfect accent to teach the small kids. It's just kind of a way to like filter through and see how hard you can work on yourself. It's just, yeah, like I hated everything about it and it's objectively not useful. Like I've been running this business for five years working exclusively with English speaking uh, clients. And it works this way. Uh, it works this way. And in fact, like I get, I keep getting compliments on my accent. Uh, I keep finding compliments under my videos. I was like, oh, I love your accent. It's part of who I am. It's part of my identity. And it screams French person to everyone who's listening. And it, it also screams like rather good French person, because if you listen to a French person who's giving a conference, like uh, often software developers or people in tech do that. Uh, because they have all those conferences in English and sometimes the expert is a French person and they have to like give their conference in English to explain their things and you hear their accent and it hurts so bad because their accent is just so strong. At least my accent is not that bad. So you can see that my English is rather good uh, thanks to my accent and the grammar in general and, and the way that I speak. So it's, I think it's important to build an identity that includes who you want to be, like who you are and who you want to be as opposed to choosing between your origin personality and some ideal native accent, which is, doesn't really mean anything because native French is, there are so many native French. I mean, where, where is that native from? Is like a Quebecois person? Is it someone from like um, sub-Saharan Africa or like a Swiss person or a French person? If French, then which part? Because the North is not the same accent as the South at all. You have even have several accents in the South. Like it's an endless quest. That's, I don't understand that anyone could still be thinking of sounding like a native as if it was a monolithic block of stuff. Like I, 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 I'm sure you can hear I'm very passionate about this stuff, but it's just, it doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, one other person that you can check on the topic of sounding, uh, not at all like a native, is Dan Locke. I'll, I'll write his name on, in the comments. Uh, he has a really, really big YouTube channel, like over a million uh, subscribers on his YouTube channel. He's an entrepreneur. He speaks about wealth building and this kind of topic. Uh, he has a really um, um, abrasive brand. Like it's not for everybody. I, I had to get used to his brand myself. It's just very braggy. I don't like. I don't like that kind of branding. But the bottom line is, uh, Dan Lok is an immigrant from Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Like the H is terrible. Uh, I'll show you why later. Uh, why the French can't make the H. Uh, he's an immigrant from Hong Kong, and he moved to uh, I think uh, Vancouver when he was 15, and then he became a businessman. And for quite some time, he tried to. Um, get his accent lessened so that it would sound like a native Canadian so that he would be able to be respected by the people that he was talking to. And eventually he met a coach who told him, no, like, like this, this is wrong. You should not try to get rid of your Hong Kong Chinese accent. You should keep it broadly because you being an immigrant in this country is what makes you you. It's what makes your brand. It's what makes you a successful person. And there is more of a concept of success if it is clear that you come from an immigration background, like from, that you're the first person who immigrated, not even first generation, but he was born in Hong Kong and immigrated when he was a teenager. And that is part of his identity. So that coach told him, yeah, like, stop that. You are making efforts that are damaging you. And that's exactly the case that I would want to make.
to you, it is important to not get rid of your accent because of that. But it is also important to not have such a large accent that you cannot be understood. So it's striking a middle ground. Does that make sense? I see we have like plenty of, um, of comments. Aha, I mimic the accent when I go to West Yorkshire. So that I can, so that I can be understood. <laughs> That's funny. I, I I'll have to listen to you speaking uh, with the West, West West Yorkshire accent someday. Yes, I mean the French accent are sexy, Dutch or German, not so much. Yeah, depends on the experience you have with them. Like I mean, but I'm happy that you find my accent sexy. That's definitely like that. Um, used to smooth out my New York accent, but I don't anymore. It's a big part of me, and I'm not ashamed of where I'm from, even though some people make fun of it. You will always, like, there's one thing I can guarantee you that there will always be some assholes in every country and you'll always find someone to make fun of you. Like, that's, I mean, you, you're you in the US, uh, like, at least Linda, you're in the US and not everybody is, but in the US, it's like this big thing of like, if you're in the US, you should be speaking English and, and whatnot. And there will always be someone to, to make fun of foreigners just because they're foreigners, even though they themselves haven't made half of the work that the foreigners have done to be here. And it's just, like, sorry, like, are there assholes in France? Yeah. Like, um, I wish I could tell you otherwise, but they're everywhere. It's not everybody, though. And you will find lots of people to appreciate you uh, and to appreciate the, the, the work that you've put in and the fact that you're able to share your culture and, and your personality with them. Uh, I've lived all over the world. That's Connie saying this. And I just pick up accent if I'm living at a place more than a year. Yep, that, that is normal. And that's probably also the reason why I don't sound like a native English speaker, because I don't live. In a native, uh, in an English-speaking country, I live in Austria. Uh, when I speak German, I, I hear I have a mix of like French and and Austrian accent. And back when I was living in Germany, that was kind of a problem. Like my ex-wife actually actively stopped me from speaking German because she felt that my accent was horrible because it was like half French, half Austrian, and she wouldn't even make sense of it. And also, she didn't like to speak German, so there's that. Um, but yeah, like I don't, I don't want to try to speak German pretending that I'm from like the north of, of Germany or not. Like that's not me. Like I speak German well enough to be understood. That's it. <laughs> and the same is true for, for English. I mean, I try to speak English and be understood smoothly uh, so that, you know, you guys can enjoy those lives and, and can enjoy when I, uh, when I speak to you either when it's one-on-one -on -one or, or whenever we're speaking to each other or when I'm speaking on a video. But that's it. I, I don't need to get better. Um, so I think that when you... Uh, in general, you say that you want to sound like a native. It means like Oxford English or standard American. Here in the West, everybody speaks American without a specific accent. So that is interesting. Um, I don't actually have uh, opinions on standard American, but I know that there is such a thing that is was used to be listed as standard French, and that recently the, the, the scholars have uh, insisted a lot that this is wrong. It's wrong to have a label standard French for what's actually a variant. There is no French which is like, standard or superior or like purer or whatever like this is all some colonialist bs and it's i think it's important to to be aware of that at least for french um of course for for the us i cannot speak this is not my area of expertise despite having a, a, a bachelor's degree in english studies i i don't feel that i would be competent to have an opinion on that um andrea says there is not really a standard american many accents yeah i guess so it's something that could be debated right so yep yeah. So basically, your goal, uh, all the point that I'm driving at, is that um, your goal is to be understood with ease. And with ease means ease on your part so that you be able to speak easily and also on the part of the person that is listening to you. So the person that is listening to you must, must be able to understand, to understand you with ease without having to make too much effort. And you also must be able to, um, to speak with ease, which is really definitely the goal of this course and i keep waving this uh, this folder here but keep in mind that it's a course that includes uh, i think two hours of videos i don't know exactly how much but it's really long videos uh, cut into several parts so that you can watch them you know in little chunks and it has also practice files so it's not it's not a book right i just keep i can wave this because it's the part that i could print uh, but the course is a lot more than that you can go to frenchfrancy.net slash pronunciation to find everything that's included and what it's all about and if you have questions, I'm happy to take them also uh, either right now or, or at the end. You have the link in the description of this video if you want to check out the course. And, uh, and again, the, um, the introductory price is until this Wednesday, so March the 3rd. After that, it will still be available, but it will be a lot more expensive. So try to check it out before Wednesday if you can. Um, 
so yeah, so basically this is what the course is all about. Like it's all about um, being understood with ease. And to be honest, it's easy when you have the right target and the right method. And I'm a little bit mad at all the apps who tries to make you just repeat by mimicking because it doesn't work this way. Unless you're very good at mimicking, which I mean, you know if it's you, uh, if you know that you're able to pronounce with an app, maybe you don't need this and it's okay. Um, but unless you're not super good at mimicking, you might not be able to succeed with an app. And the worst part is that the app is typically calibrated to understand, um, understand. It's not like the app understands, right? They're just trying to hear something and they will validate if it's close enough to the original. But the thing is a native speaker or a speaker, even not a native, is a lot more forgiving than an app. Uh, the apps just aren't there yet. Uh, so it's possible that your pronunciation would be perfectly acceptable but it's not 100% like the natives, and then the app will keep rejecting you, which is extremely, extremely frustrating. So that's why I would definitely recommend to learn pronunciation with something a bit more old school, a bit more low tech than, uh, than an app, because yeah, like I said, they're not there yet. So on this course, you have some practice files. You have, well, it's one file, which is 10 minutes long, where you can practice all the sounds that are in, that are in French and not in English. And that's actually where I'm driving at later. So it's not an app. You just have a song that makes you repeat. If you want, you can record yourself over the file and, and check by listening, um, check that you're doing it right. In my experience with my one-on-one -on -one clients, when I give them a tongue twister file and I have explained to them the, uh, the different songs that, that they make wrong, how to make them right, it's also something that's in the course. I have those videos and I explain to you for each single song exactly how they are, they are made. Like with placing your mouth and place, like if you have uh, hair coming from here, here, or if you have air coming through your nose, I'll explain all of that. How each sound is made, um, I will show you in the in the handout because we have the the um, the charts and it's really uh, convenient to understand. So yeah, I explain all of that in the course, and then once you know how it's done, you're a lot more likely to do it successfully. I think that makes sense, right? If someone explains to you how to do something, you're more likely to be successful at it than if the person tells you. Just do it, which is what most apps do and most, um, yeah, most practice things do. So I hope that makes sense. If you have any question about that, uh, please ask. I'm just going to read a couple of uh, comments. OK, in that case, no, I just want to speak good French. Right, it's, it's just what you want. Like, speak good French, speak with ease, and be understood easily. Uh, Linda says, in acting, there are sorts of general accent, like there's the original East Coast accent, for example, which is what you, Glory, with British used to play house. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so I guess if you're an actor, then you will probably be uh, having more opportunities to like fake accents and things like that. Um, probably if you're an actor, you don't need a course like this. Um, but if you're not an actor, that could be a great idea. Um, so the next question that I have, which I'm sure you're interested in, is why, 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 why does it feel so hard uh, to pronounce French? And also, I mean, I just told you that if you have the right method, uh, you can de deal with it in two to three weeks. And, and it's true. I mean, my one-on-one -on -one students, when I give them a file, they work on it. After two weeks, their pronunciation is good enough to be understood by it. Uh, and I, I see that time and again, like it, it really works. You could, like, if you would buy this course, you'd be and you do it seriously uh, and and use the pronunciation. Uh, you know, you'd watch it and then you'd use the the practice file for two weeks. In two weeks, you you can have no problem at all with uh, being understood in French. Not perfect like a native, whatever, but speaking French well enough that you'll be understood and two, it won't hurt. Because when you think about it, if you try to do the sound like like this, like you can try it in your corner because you don't have a, a microphone, so it's not, uh, I'm not gonna hear it. But if you do like that, it will hurt unless you're trained. I'm trained, I'm a French native, I can keep doing forever, but you probably can't. And the, the reason is because your muscles are not trained and it's just like trying to make a movement with your muscles that you're not used to make, and that that you need to uh, that you need to practice. So in in this course, you have two different exercises to practice the the sound and, and become practiced at it. Like I said, it takes two weeks. It's just a little bit of dedication. It's a lot faster than trying to achieve perfect grammar. <laughs> so who wants to know why it is why it feels so hard, uh, or why French pronouncing French is so hard for English natives? I can show you directly from the handout. Um, French in Senegal was very different from the French that I'm used to hearing. Oh, yes. Like, I mean, Senegal is practically sub-Saharan sub Africa. And yes, uh, their accent is very, 
um, very typical and, and very different from the French. Like if, if a, Sen a person from Senegal would uh, come to, like from actual Senegal, not an immigrant. I mean, in France, we have a lot of uh, immigrants from Senegal or like second generation or third generation. Those, of course, speak like, like we do. But if someone from Senegal goes to, um, goes to France, uh, like in a trip or just immigrates, and at the beginning, we will immediately know that they are from Senegal. Same for, Con for Congo or for other uh, African countries. They have very distinct accents in Africa. So songs that English speakers don't make, and we have uh, Omo Waleo. Sorry, I, I'm sure I can't pronounce your name right. That's, that's, that's embarrassing. Yes, I want to know why it's so difficult. OK, so let's look at it. So like I said, we have in the course, you have a 20 pages handout. And the first uh, few pages, I explain basically the difference uh, in how human language works. Uh, well, the, it's also the first minutes in the video. Uh, what is phonetics? So phonetics is the science of the sound of a language, and how babies learn language. So this is something that is important to know. A healthy human baby is born with the ability to pronounce all the human sounds, all of them. And do I have a visual of all the human sounds? Yes. So this is here for illustration, but I'm not sure if you can see. This is all the sounds that exist in the human language. So those are all the vowels and all the consonants. It's an insane amount of different sounds that can be made with the human phonetary organ with these organs that we have. Like, take a moment to appreciate the amazing capacity that you have uh, with your phonetary organs to make all those sounds. No other species is able to do that. This is just our, uh, our shared um, wealth as humans. This is the human body uh, capacity to make this. Like, personally, I'm in total awe when I think that we can make all those sounds with our bodies. But when I say we can, I mean that actually a healthy human baby can. And so if you've heard a baby when they start making sounds, you've noticed or you probably noticed that they make all sorts of sounds and they don't really know what they're doing, but they just make all sorts of sounds. And what happens is that that's the first step of learning to speak. And the second step is that they actually discriminate between the sounds that they hear and which they can also make. So if they hear a sound, they also keep making it. And if the sound that they have made is not heard in their environment, they think, oh, uh, I guess that's not a sound and they stop making it. And that happens really in the first month of, uh, of the life, like when, uh, when a baby starts making sounds. I'm actually not an expert in like, what age they do that. But if you've had children, maybe you'll remember. I, I don't have children myself, unfortunately. So that's the whole idea is that they're the first stage when they can produce all these sounds. And I mean, I mean all of them, all, all of these sounds. Look at that. And so then in the second stage, they select uh, the sounds of only their native language. And that's the reason why, for example, if you want to raise your kids bilingual or trilingual or with however many languages, it's good to have the languages around them when they are small, because yes, it will take them a little bit longer to start speaking because they will need to sort things out a lot more. But then they will have the capacity to speak later without having to retrain their pronunciation. Unfortunately, if you're now an adult and you're, they, typically we say that if you do it under four years old, uh, you're good. But if you are now above four and you haven't done it, then it's too late and you we will have to retrain it. But of course, you know, it's possible because these are the same phonetary organs. You're just a little bit older and will take you a little bit more practice, similar to how um, it will take more practice to pick up a sport or pick up a motor skill like knitting or driving. If you do that as an adult, it's harder than if you do it when you're younger. So basically, that's what happened. So some of those French sounds, like the R and the R, all those sounds, you considered when you were a kid that they weren't the sounds because your parents weren't making them. And then that's why we stopped making them. And that's why now you, quote unquote, can't. So it's not that you can't. Your organs are cap capable of doing it. But you need basically muscle training, like retraining, learning to place your organs in the different way to make the French sounds. And so these charts I find super interesting. And uh, I, I had so much fun preparing the course. These are the vowels of French and the vowels of English. So please take a moment to appreciate or, or not appreciate the insane amount of vowels that are in English. These are all the vowels of the English language. I don't think I will try pronouncing them because I probably can't. And the reason why I have an accent is probably because I make some of those not like they're supposed to be made. So yeah, like. I mean, that trap and bath and palm have different vowels, and except it's, even though they're all written with an A. Uh, I mean, I know I'm probably making a fool of myself trying to pronounce that right now, because like I said, I, I didn't skip the class in university, but I didn't love it. 
Um, so I'm not an expert in English phonetics. And I actually, uh, I wrote note here that the English vowel system is so complex that I gave up on circling everything that's different from the French. So lots of those vowels we don't have in French. In French, we have a small number of vowels, which you can see here. So every one of those sounds is a vowel in French, like all those signs is a vowel in French. And everything that I circled in red is what you don't have in English. So this is why it is so hard, because those sounds don't exist in English. And that's a total of uh, one, two, three, seven. Seven different vowels that exist in France, in French that don't exist in English. In fact, there are only a total of, let me count them, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, seven, eight vowels that's in common, and another seven that's different. So half of the French vowels are not in English. And those, those I can actually pronounce. So it's U, E, wait. Yes, uh, this, this one is E, E, and the en, un, on, which are the nasals. So in English, there are no nasals. A nasal is a vowel. I hope that makes sense when I say vowel and use those, those, kind, of, um, those kind of sounds. If that doesn't, uh, in the course, I explain everything, that what's a vowel, uh, what's a nasal, like what's the difference between a vowel and a consonant, all of that I put in the course. Like I assume in the course that you don't know anything. But of course, today I only have an hour and I'm just like kind of like, you know, vibing with you. So I can't explain everything. But if any of that is unclear, then that's a good reason to join the course because I really start from scratch and explain every single definition. So yeah, half of the French vowels uh, are not here. And the nasals are the vowels that have a, uh, you have to put some air through your nose while you're speaking. And that's something you don't know how to do in English. Or you have it a little bit in the sound ing, like when you, uh, when you say painting or, or sleeping or speaking, the ing sound that gives you a bit of the, of the vibe of uh, putting air through your nose. Um, and then you have to do that, but with just a vowel, no consonant. So I hope that makes sense. And then on the next page, we have the consonant. And this is French consonant, and this is English consonant. So you can notice that in English, you have three consonants that do not exist in French. And those are the ones that are hard for me, uh, because it's not that natural for me to pronounce them. So those are the um, the, and, and I actually don't know the difference uh, between those two, the and another similar one. Uh, that's not, uh, I'm not thinking of it right now. And the ha, like we spoke about it earlier today, the ha, I, I can't, like in Oxford, in Oxford, Harryford and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly ever happen. I have to focus so hard to be able to do that. Why? Because the French don't have this column. Like you can see here that this is listed as a glottal consonant. And if you look at the French, there is no glottal, like the, the column is gone. So we don't have this. But what do we have? We have the uvular it's called uvula, it's the r right here. So this is the only consonant that exists in French that you don't have in English. So it's called uvular here and you don't have a uvular here. So it doesn't matter if you don't understand the, um, if you don't understand the chart, like the chart is not here for you to understand. It's just here as a visualization as to why it is difficult and why you specifically have to focus on those sounds. It's because you don't have them in English. So I just had a lot of fun creating that for the course so that you could really visualize how that works. And then uh, later in, down the line in the course, I go on to explaining how you practice, how you make them. So like for example, for the R, so-called uvular, that means it's here in the throat, and that's where you have to, to pronounce it. So in the course, I explain specifically all, I mean, there's only one consonant, so that's fast. And then I go on to explain all the vowels. So there are some which are oral, nasal, rounded, unrounded, like that's really phonetic terms. Um, but then I explain them in the course really easily in the way that you understand. And for example, a rounded vowel means that your mouth is round. So it helps to know that it's rounded because your mouth is round. So for example, U, which is really difficult often for English natives, U is the vowels you make with your, with your round mouth. And U and U are also round vowels. And they are different because they are pronounced at a different place in your, uh, in your mouth. So that's something that I go uh, really much in depth in the course. So please tell me if that makes sense. Um, I hope that is understandable, even though it's just, you know, vibing with not a lot of structure, uh, because I can't have slides on YouTube. Uh, in the course, I, I did all of that on Zoom. I recorded it with live students who were giving me feedback and everything. And I had those slides. I think there are like 60 slides in the course, which you can also download. So it's a lot more structured in the course than it is now. Like now I'm just, you know, having fun with you. Um, right. So if you have any question, um, now is a good time to ask them. And then as like the last point for today, I would love 
to practice pronouncing with you the words that you find difficult in French. So I see there are like 10 people watching right now. So please type in the chat the words that you find difficult, and I will explain to you uh, how to pronounce them and why they're difficult and how you can make them easier. I think that's a fun way to, um, to finish this uh, live. And of course, you're welcome to quote, uh, to ask anything, even if it's not related to uh, pronunciation towards the end of the live. I'm always happy to answer any question that's either about French learning or about me or about how I work or, you know, really whatever, like about France. As long as I can answer, I'm happy to answer it. So, Jasmine is saying, I think that if you speak Dutch, you can make pretty much any and every sound in every language. Good question. I haven't researched it. I haven't studied Dutch myself. Um, are you, are you um, implying that Dutch has like so many sounds, like, like all of those? Wait, because I mean, that's a lot of sounds. Like no, lang no language can possibly have all those sounds. Like look at that. Like, can, you, can you see it? I don't, know, like, I don't know if the video quality is good enough for you to see it, but look at this, like seriously. Okay, <laughs> Linda is like, you know I'm gonna ask for yaourt, yaourt. Um, it's an interesting word. I, it's a rather recent word. We haven't had yogurt forever, so that's yogurt in French. Um, some people actually also say yogurt in French, so really taking the, the French word. Uh, yaourt, so really you need to cut it in the middle. Uh, it's very uncommon in French that two vowels meet. We think it's not elegant, so most of the time when that happens, we just do something to avoid it. But here it's in the middle of the word, there's nothing we can do. So ya, ya should be quite easy. Ya, and then you have u, u is easy as well, and then ch, the ch sound. So you need to be able to do the ch sound and then t at the end. So ya urt. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, you can try doing ya urt in your corner and see if you can do it. And if you have a follow up question uh, on this one, I'm happy to answer that. Um, Andrea says, weirdly enough, I have trouble with the word do. Oh, you're not the only one. I keep. I think I teach this every single week in some of my one-on-one -on -one, uh, courses uh, or sessions. Um, students struggle with the difference between de and dos. And uh, let me write that down. So de is two, and dos is twelve. It's not the same. <laughs> it's not at all the same. So that's the kind of thing. I know this sounds similar, but de is with like your mouth a bit more rounded and, and the vowel is more closer to the front and do's is with your mouth more open and the ooh is in the back. And so do's, you also have the z sound and do, you don't hear anything at the end. So I hope that makes sense. Um, do and do's are really big ones. There's also trois, which is three, trois and treize. So treize is with like the open, uh, like large mouth. And that this sound you actually have in English, like you should be able to do the a sound. Because it's like in, um, I can actually don't know what is, like in face, kind of. So, a, uh, 13 versus 3. Um, yes, I can make them all. Why T is grounded in en fait? So, I guess uh, grounded, you mean silent, you, you mean uh, spoken, sounded. And some people actually pronounce the T in en fait, and some people don't. I think the people who pronounce it are more numerous. But if you say en fait, it's not wrong. Some people do it this way. I would tend to think that if it's en fait, you would, uh, it would be in plural, but that's just what it sounds to me, like it's just my intuition. So yeah, some people sound it, some people don't. I agree that by French spelling rules, it should not be sounded. By the way, also in this course, so also in the videos, but also in the handout uh, and in the slides, you have towards the end an introduction to French spelling and why French is spelled this, the way it is with this annoying, um, these annoying silent vowels and where they are from. So that's, that's part three in this course, an introduction to French spelling. I am dying to make a longer full course on French spelling, but that will depend on my French Frontier Accelerator students, the kind of topics that they pick. So I look forward to, to seeing, I think the next one will be in May or April. I, I really look forward to seeing what you will pick next. Last time, the, the course I made was uh, about motivation. The, the workshop I made for the accelerator was about motivation. Um, this one, like, it's still written in the handout that it's French Fancy Accelerator Workshop number seven. So if you, have, uh, if you have bought the French Life Launchpad, you know that these are workshop one, two, and three that have been recycled as the French Life Launchpad to make it a smaller, more affordable course. And this is the number seven. So there are 
four, five, six. There are three in the middle and there are another eight that came later. I do plan on releasing them all little by little so you can have access to just the ones you want to have rather than joining the entire French Frontier Accelerator. However, if you want to access them all already, uh, we have courses about um, verbs. We have two about verbs. We have one about achieving fluency. We have one about having meaningful conversation in French. We have one about manifesting techniques for learning French. And uh, we have one about energy clearing for learning French. Um, help me out, Linda. I don't remember uh, everything that we've done. I, I, I make them, then I put them in the member zone, then I forget their existence. Um, it's not true. I don't forget their existence. I actually have a list, but I don't have it here. So yeah, in the French Fancy Accelerator, we have all of those courses. So all of the courses that I will release in this year uh, individually, they're all already in the French Fancy Accelerator. So if you want to have them right away, you can always join uh, the French Accelerator. I still have the actually 2019 price on it. Uh, so it's $697 a year uh, to join the French Accelerator. And then you get access to everything. So all the courses, you also have uh, French classes. Uh, we have four or five, depending on how you count them so far. And the next one is on the 21st of March. Um, and so that, those are classes when you can practice French as a group. We take a video or a song um, and we um, answer questions about it, and which is an opportunity to ex express yourself and learn more about uh, French culture. So, yep, that's a little bit about the course. Do you have uh, any other question? Uh, a year. I'm not sure if that's the question. But yeah, like the French French Accelerator is a subscription because I keep making new content every month. So like I said, uh, I made the 15th uh, workshop. I mean, the numbers don't matter. It's just that I like to count them. But yeah, you have like you have the equivalent of 15 of those courses in the French Accelerator. And I think you have the French Life Launchpad. So you, 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 have, a, um, you have a discount too that you can apply to your year. So for you, it will be cheaper. Um, I'm, if you don't have your discount code for the French Life Launchpad, I think it's $150 off um, of your first year. And then you can uh, you can email me and I send you the, the discount code. But I think it's in the member zone. Yes, it's the it's per year, like I just explained. Um, so, um, Connie saying I have been practicing the French R and trying to do the grow. I don't think it has worked out well for me. It's discouraging. Um, what's happening then? Like the uh, can you do this? Like it, it's normal if you can't sustain it for a uh, long time at the beginning. Like, you know, you can aim to do like two seconds the first day and three seconds the next day and four seconds the, the, the you know, the next day and just try to do it a little bit more every day. Uh, and it's, it's just a practice and it's just to, um, to just help with your muscles here. So, yeah. Wow, we are almost 50 minutes in. So that's, that's going well, I guess. I love that you're being all engaged and participating and asking questions. Uh, if any of you has another... French word, like, you know, écureuil. Let me type that in. Écureuil. It means scroll. Scroll. I'm going to spell it. Scroll roll. I don't even know if that's spelled this way. Sorry. Like, my English isn't working. It's almost 8 p.m. I'm not done with my work day. I have other things to do, uh, especially for my uh, clients still. But écureuil. That's one of the worst uh, French words that uh, are the hardest to pronounce because there's an œil at the end. And there's a U in the middle, so écureuil, and you have the R. Oh, yeah, it's cruel with two R's, right? So écureuil. Another word that um, some of my clients have struggled with, it's not listed as like a difficult word by polyglots, but it's very challenging. I've seen for, I've noticed for my one-on-one -on -one clients, it's chirurgie, that means surgery. So because I teach uh, many um, doctors and surgeons and people who deal with health in general, then chirurgie is a word that's going to come up, and that's really difficult. Um, so Lina is saying, I can do the r, but where it trips me up is when there are lots of them in one word, like préféré. Oh my god, yes. One of my favorite these days, préféré. For some reason, it keeps coming up in my one-on-one -on -one sessions too. Préféré. It's actually spelled with uh, the accent. Préféré. Yep. It's it's a practice. Like you can you can repeat it. So for example, when I know that I'm booked out now, so you can't book my one-on-one -on -one coaching. But when I do one-on-one -on -one coaching, I actually make the files with those words that are challenging for the student in particular. But to be honest, uh, the file that's in this course should be good enough. It has been made uh, custom tailored for English natives. So if you're an English native, it will work for you. So we have uh, Andrea is suggesting you, and Linda is suggesting oy. So Un oeil is an eye, les yeux is the eyes. So it's oeil with e, right? It's, it's a diphthong, oeil, 
and it's ye. So ye, you have the ye sound, like the same sound as in es in English. So that should be easy. And then e, uh, you have to form your mouth in this shape, e, uh, and pronounce it like towards the front, but not completely at the front, like in the middle of your mouth. So e, uh, ye. Does that make sense? Can you can you pronounce it this way? Anyone else has other words or other questions about you know anything? Like I'm happy to hang out. It's like the last ten minutes, and we can just have like a bit more relaxing. I can give another tea. Linda says, "Oh, Andrea says we," oui, and Linda says, "Yes, that helps." Okay, I'm happy that it helps. Um, yeah, that this is probably the only live I will make about pronunciation in a long time because there are all sorts of other uh, topics that I want to speak about. By the way, if there are topics that you want to see in those live. Uh, in those weekly sessions, please give them to me right now. Uh, I know that last uh, week or so, I uh, was picking it. I picked a topic that was uh, from here, and that was uh, really helpful. And so it's it's really helpful if you can give me the kind of thing that you're struggling with, and then I can make a live about it. So you know how to um, speak French. Like oh yeah, that was how to speak French without cramming. And yeah, it was it was a really good live. It's been. Um, very followed, like lots that has had lots of views even after uh, I was live. So it's um, it's a good topic. How to prepare for B1 exam? Oh, um, this one, this exam. Um, I assume you mean Delft B1, right? Because I don't think there's another B1 uh, exam in in French. Um, yeah, that is probably more like a topic for a pre-recorded video because I don't think that many people would be interested in hearing it live. Um, but it's definitely I can make videos on these topics. Uh, that's um, I think I actually recorded those videos, but that was years ago, back when I was still married. And I think those recordings have just disappeared in the whole breakup situation. So I'll have to to make them again. I think it was about B two two, B two. So yep, I'll I'll definitely uh, take into account uh, preparing for B one or A two or all the Delft exams. If you have a more specific question uh, about how to prepare for B1, like if there's a particular thing that uh, that's annoying you right now, you can ask right now, and uh, else I'll I'll yeah I'll try to make a video about that. Um, is there anything else you'd like to hear or know about? We got like another five minutes left. Otherwise, I'm gonna go. I have I still have a roadmap to make for uh, my one of my one-on-one -on -one clients. Um, so the roadmap is the thing that I use in my one-on-one -on -one client in my one-on-one -on -one coaching, and it's also the thing that you can learn in the French Life Launchpad. Uh, I can actually tell you a bit more about the French Life Launchpad. It's not uh, on offer now, but I think it will be soon because my birthday is coming up next week. So there probably will be a, a new promotion for um, the the existing courses. Um, but for the uh, pronunciation courses, definitely the cheapest that you'll ever get is this week because I really want to um, give more uh, benefits to the people who jump in fast. Like if you're a first mover and you want to join early and you're an OG and you were here before I even made live, even before I even made courses, uh, you should have a special, you know, special treatment. So $89 is the cheapest it'll ever be. Um, but um, yeah, so that's until uh, Wednesday. And the French Life Launchpad is I think $297 right now. Um, but I can tell you about this because this is the um, this is the core of the method that I teach. This course uh, you can use it on your own; it will work. But it will work even better if you stack it on top of this. This is not in the right order. This is the order. So in the French Life Launchpad, as well as in my one-on-one -on -one coaching. But like I said, it's booked out now, so you absolutely cannot book it this month. Um, I will let you know when I have more. You can always join the French Monsieur Accelerator too. Like we have the same core method, and then you can get a hold of me in the uh, French Accelerator Facebook group uh, more easily. So the first thing is that you need to have a routine. That's actually not in this order in the launchpad. Uh, we start with this one, which is the things that you need to learn. It's really important because uh, what you need to learn for your own life is different from uh, what another person needs to learn. So in the French Life Launchpad, I walk you through um, the uh, creation of this plan, which is absolutely completely personal to you. And also, when I teach one on one, I, I make this plan for my student. I actually have one uh, to make tonight uh, so I can deliver it to my new client. And then you have another workshop, like another uh, part of the course, which is about choosing your resources. So that means your books, uh, your YouTube channels, your podcasts, and all the things that help you learn the real French, not learn the French that you have in your, um, in, 
like in a school, for example, because most schools will teach you French that you might not um, you might not need to learn or that might not be really relevant or that might not be actionable. So this basically point like this method is here because it will teach you what's relevant and actionable. And then uh, the last part of the course is about creating your routine, which will help you just make this plan a reality and actionate these resources. So a question is, uh, that's from Colm, is, in your opinion, is there a massive gap between B1 and B2 level and competence? It seems similar to me. Oh, no, there is a massive gap. So basically, I wrote an article about that. It was published on italki back in the days. Um, I think it was called choosing, setting your language level goals or something like that, where I explained um, in understandable terms by a non-linguist, uh, the, the A1, A2, B1, B2 scale. Uh, it, that, it has six uh, levels. So A1, A2, B1, B2, um, and C1, C2. And the thing is that every time it doubles. So they say it takes 60 to 80 hours. I actually don't know when, how they count that, but it gives you an idea. Uh, 60 to 80 hours to reach A1. And then you need to put another 60 to 80 hours to reach A2. So A2 is du the double as A1. And then you need to put another like 150 hours or so to reach B1. So there, it takes as long to, get between, to go from A2 to B1 uh, then to go from zero to A2. And then it takes as long again to go from B1 to B2, then to, uh, then it took from, to go from zero to B1. And then again, you have to double it for C1 and then again for C2, which nobody does. Um, and that's, um, that's really the difference. Actually, you, you, I know that you're in the French Life um, Launchpad, so you can use this plan that you've made in the first, uh, in the first module of the French Life Launchpad. And you can use this, uh, this scale as a way to uh, see where you're at. Um, I, I'm sure that if a linguist like, or like a language expert from the European Union would hear me say that, they would scream because that's not at all how it's intended to be used. But it works this way. Uh, it's, it's really good enough for like, you know, daily uh, language learning. Um, and so the thing is, column three, I can do it, but it's quite uncomfortable. That would correspond to B1. So what characterizes B1 is that whenever you're in a situation, like in, in France, for example, even if you have some problem, you know, it's not too bad a problem, but you know, someone at the restaurant brings you the, the wrong thing or like you missed your train, that kind of problem, um, you will be able to get by and to solve this problem, but it will not be comfortable. So that's, that's the definition of B1 is that, yeah, you, you'll survive, but it's not, gonna be to be, it's not going to be comfortable for you or for the other person. Both of you will have to put in efforts so that the communication would go through. And versus B2, B2 is being able to do the same thing, but completely comfortably like a breeze. So basically the kind of conversation that we're having now that I'm like the, the level that I'm speaking is probably close to B2, or given that I'm having a, uh, a topic that's academic, you know, French pronunciation, and that's like my field of my area of expertise, I would say it's perhaps closer to a C1. But normally, the kind of conversation that you have in your daily life are B2 level conversations. Like, for example, in German, the highest degree I have, or actually the only degree I have, is in a B2 in German. And I never went farther than B2, and I never have any problem. So really, B2 is the level that you need to live in the country and, and do everything in the country. While B1, I mean, if you live in a country with only B1, you'll have lots of frictions and lots of uh, challenges. So it, it, yeah, it's a massive gap. How do they judge these things? Um, I'm actually not sure what you're referring to. Um, how do they judge the level or how do they create the scale? Or can you, can you rephrase the question? Because I'm, I'm not really sure what you were driving at. Like, how do they decide what you, what's your level? Or right, I'm just, I'm not really understanding the question. If everyone is patient, everything is comfortable. Right, let's just say that if you're at level B2, no one needs to be patient. If you're at level B1, you need a lot of patience. That you, you can phrase it in terms of patience uh, versus in, in terms of comfort, but it's, you know, it's the same idea, basically. OK, so it's almost time to go. So if there's another like, really quick question, or uh, if you can rephrase the previous one, come and I can answer it. I'm happy to hang out a couple more minutes. Else, uh, I will dash soon, because it's 8 PM for me, and I have another roadmap to make. It's probably another like one, two hours of work. Till today, um, being completely uh, booked out in my coaching just gives me a lot of work, but I love it. So it's amazing. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. 
And thank you for uh, being with me and showing up on all the live. I know that last week, I think we had 87, 97 comments. I don't remember. So I'm curious to see how many comments there will be this time. I'm, I'm still uh, looking at uh, expecting to see that one day we'll break the 100 comments uh, mark. So I don't know. There's a lot of comments today for sure. And um, yeah. Oh, there's a comment, question from Sashin that I, uh, that I mixed. Sorry about that. How to prepare for the listening part in the B1 exam? OK, so the best way that you can prepare for the listening part is to get one of these books. Um, this one is called Réussir le Delph. It's good if you have this logo on the book. So that's, that's the logo you're looking for. Every book that's official will have this logo. You have probably two or three different books. And uh, these books, they come with a CD. Like there's a CD in it. You'll, have a CD, you'll need a CD player. And that will uh, train you to do those exercises. The listening part is um, the most challenging, according to most students who have taken any of those exams. They just like, and that's the one you do first. And often the students are like, oh my god, it was so hard. Like, what's that going to be? If all the others are so hard, I'm going to fail. No, um, most of the time, the listening part is really hard. The rest is not, not that hard for most students. Um, but yeah, like the best thing, the best way to prepare is to have the book and, uh, and work with the exercises in the book and with the CD. So I hope that helps. I would offer you to, to sign up for one-on-one -on -one coaching, but I don't have a spot. Sorry. OK, so what do we have? Have a great evening. Uh, oh, thank you, Connie. Have a great uh, day. I guess it's the middle of the day for you. Uh, thank you, Om Omawaleo, for being here, even though I butcher your name every time. Uh, Linda says, thank you, enjoy your work, and congratulations on all the clients. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm really appreciating this, uh, this situation. I'm enjoying all the new clients. They're all amazing. They're all special. Uh, they're all very individual, because that's why I, I do you know, coaching with only. Normally, I have seven spots, but I just so happen to have eight clients, because they're just all rushed in really fast. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm overbooked, basically. Um, Scom says the 500 word native is C2 to me. Um, yeah, that's because those levels are really hard to understand for someone who's not an expert in language learning. That's, it's really something I, 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 I blame that scale for. It's a scale that you can only understand if you have not only your language learning expert, but also you have actively studied the scale. And that scale is described in a 400 pages book, which they made me read. And, and, it's, and it's the driest read I've ever, like it's, it's the worst thing, like don't read it. It's called the CEFR, uh, Common European uh, Framework of Reference for Languages, something like that. I'm not sure how it is in English, um, but it's, yeah, no, like someone who has 500 words is, should be a B1, uh, or like actually B1 is supposed to be 1,000 words. It's what they used to call it the threshold level, uh, because in the 70s they calculated that when you have 1,000 words, if it's the right words, then you're able to like get by. And that's why it's the threshold level. That's the level where you become autonomous. So 500 words, you won't be able to do everything with 500 words, not even if you're native. But they sound like C2 to you because they are fluent, which is why I keep saying every single time that fluency is not a number of words that you know. Fluency is just the feeling and the fact that it flows. That, that's all there is to it. So yep. But Linda's emphasizing with you. All right, guys. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, I hope I've answered all of your questions. That I haven't skipped any and that uh, everyone has got their answers. I will be back next week. Uh, I don't know the topic yet, um, but I will um, think of something. I'll, I'll, um, maybe I'll post a little poll on Telegram so that you can uh, choose, um, choose it. If you're not with me on Telegram yet, uh, I'm just going to give you the link in the chat right now. Uh, because I see there are a bunch of people still on the call. So let me just give you the Telegram link so you can join it. Uh, I've noticed that we've hit 70,000, no, not 1,000, 70 subscribers. Sorry, I'm getting tired. 70 subscribers today. So I'm super grateful that you're here. Uh, I do share on Telegram more often than on YouTube. Um, so I mean, on YouTube, I'm only live once a week. But on Telegram, you know, when I find something cool uh, for the, your daily French bath or something I, I just think that can benefit you, I will share it on Telegram. And those are the things that mostly don't make it into the, the emails, just because it takes a bit more effort uh, on me to, to uh, post the emails. So on Telegram, it's just a, a lot easier. So if you have Telegram, please join it. Uh, the link is in the chat right now. Uh, please just grab it. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure it's in the description too. If you are struggling with French pronunciation, mastering French pronunciation is still available to you uh, at the uh, cheapest price uh, until Wednesday. I mean, it's going to be probably around midnight Pacific that uh, it will change because I, I have to do it manually. So when I get up on Thursday, I'll, I'll change it. So if you want it, please jump in before Wednesday, well, before Wednesday evening so that you can have the, the cheapest price that will ever be. All right, so that's it. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for being here for over an hour with me. 
It was amazing. Uh, as usual, I loved it. And I will see you next Monday. Bye.